councilman came in and said, Kathy, you got 20 minutes to evacuate City Hall. The water's coming. And I said, where are we going? He goes, that's what your 20 minutes is for. I love where I live. And I love my neighbors. I don't want to leave. The emotional toll is really tough when you're in these towns and people absolutely lost everything that they, you know, acquired throughout their whole life. In 2019, floodwaters inundated the southwest Iowa town of Hamburg, submerging most of the town of just over 900 under 18 feet of water. In 2011, Dubuque, Iowa was granted a presidential disaster declaration, the sixth one to be given in just over a decade. In 2008, the city of Cedar Rapids was inundated by a record 31 feet of water when the Cedar River left its banks. Catastrophic flooding events have written and rewritten Iowa's landscape. By some estimates, these recent events have been driven by climate change. But one thing has remained constant, the victims of flooding in Iowa have shown their resilience through how they have restored their lives and renewed their communities, all while maintaining their respect for Iowa's waterways. Funding for this program was provided by Friends, the Iowa PBS Foundation, as well as generations of families and friends who feel passionate about the programs they watch on Iowa PBS. Funding for this program was provided by the Gilchrist Foundation, founded by Jocelyn Gilchrist, furthering the philanthropic interests of the Gilchrist family in wildlife and conservation, the arts and public broadcasting, and disaster relief. And by the Claude P. Small, Catherine Small Cousins, and William Carl Cousins Fund at the Quad Cities Community Foundation to support nature programming on Iowa PBS. Floods in Iowa are a common occurrence. Runoff from snowmelt, coupled with routine spring rains, can push the boundaries of rivers and streams to their limits and beyond. Many of these events come and go with limited damage or life interruptions. But sometimes, the right weather conditions combine to produce epic flooding events that destroy large swaths of cities and towns, changing people's lives forever. The National Weather Service lists five particular flooding events as significant in Iowa's history. Number one on that list, and top of mind for countless Iowans, is the Great Flood of 1993. In the summer of that year, Iowa endured daily rains that didn't stop for 130 days. 10,000 people were evacuated from their homes as all 99 counties in Iowa received a presidential disaster declaration. Officials with the National Weather Service believe the stage was set for the event in 1992, when an unusually cold, wet winter made for abundant soil moisture. By 1993, plentiful summer rains proved to be too much for the already saturated soil. The runoff caused already swollen rivers to flow into the surrounding countryside. The result was the destruction of 21,000 homes and the loss of one life. Damage estimates were more than $3 billion, a number that would strike $7 billion today. In 2018, the same conditions can be found in southwest Iowa, setting the stage for some of the worst flooding in the region's history. Situated between the Missouri and Nishnabotna rivers in southwest Iowa, Hamburg has witnessed its fair share of high water events. But in 2019, the commercial hub of Fremont County, Iowa, nearly had its existence washed off the map. We had three days warning, 
And in those three days, we evacuated uh, as many people as we could. We informed the businesses. Um, we did what preparation we could do because we knew it was going to be a massive amount of water. We didn't know at the time that it was going to be 18 foot of water coming at our small town. Kathy Crane is the former mayor of Hamburg. During her tenure, she guided her town through the recovery effort for both the 2011 and 2019 floods. While most of the state was dealing with varying degrees of drought, the southwest corner of Iowa received record amounts of rainfall. Throughout the winter of 2018, as rain changed to snow, moisture levels in the soil were more than the ground could handle. Dr. Justin Glisson is the climatologist for the state of Iowa. So you put 2018, 2019 together, wettest two calendar years going back 149 years. So what that means, very wet subsoils, near capacity, if not at capacity. You get any kind of rainfall on top of that, once it does thaw, it's not going into the soil, it's gonna run off. February of 2019 recorded some of the coldest temperatures for that time of year. The ample autumn rain in the area that had been absorbed by the soil was now frozen solid. On March 13, 2019, one of the lowest barometric pressure systems ever recorded moved from Colorado to Iowa. Known as a bomb cyclone, the storm system delivered torrents of rain into an already frozen landscape. You get anywhere from two to three inches of rainfall on top of an existing snowpack of three to six inches. Uh, you're getting four to six inches of liquid equivalent moisture running off into the river systems. Yeah, you look in the western part of the state, you had a transfusion of an epic amount of water into the M Missouri Basin, let alone the amount of rainfall that was coming down from north of us. On top of saturated soil and a bomb cyclone, Gavin's Point Dam on the Missouri River in South Dakota was nearing the point where its output was at the maximum for its spillway. In Nebraska, a dam on the Niobrara River near Spencer failed, and the situation went from bad to worse for communities downriver. So you had 11 feet of water coming down once the Spencer Dam failed. Every core levee south of Council Bluffs was either um, breached or destroyed. By March 18, the stage was set for a disaster. Mayor Crane was in City Hall when, at 4.30 in the morning, an 18-foot wall of water was rushing towards Hamburg, and there was nothing they could do to stop it. I had a crew of people walk in here. Our councilman came in and said, Kathy, you got 20 minutes to evacuate City Hall. The water's coming. And I said, where are we going? He goes, that's what your 20 minutes is for. So. I called the school and we packed up what we could and we moved to the school. And we were there until we could come back to City Hall. And I can tell you, you can run a disaster with a cell phone and a laptop because that's what the city clerk and I did for days. Hamburg and other towns along the Missouri River are not strangers to flooding and the residents often are able to recover from the usual inches of water with relative ease. But the wall of water almost two stories high that was surging through their towns left people helpless as they watched their lives and their livelihoods wash down the river. The emotional toll is really tough when you're in these towns and people absolutely lost everything that they've you know, acquired throughout their whole life. And it's, it's all gone. And even some of these city workers, you know, lost a lot during the flood. And <laughs> there are a lot of dedication with those city guys. I mean, they're out there working around the clock, even though they lost and they, they had damage. And, and they're trying to do the, the better good to help everybody instead of just trying to, to help themselves. Zeb McFarlane is a circuit rider for the western region of the Iowa Rural Water Association. McFarlane is trained to assist communities in the restoration of water service during disasters. 
I would say a lot of the experience that I relied on was being a prior city operator, knowing how the treatment process works, how the disinfection process works, how water systems are laid out, potentially where, where's this valve underneath the water. It's, it's very tough to find that stuff when it's underwater. He recalls how the entire Hamburg City staff, old and new members alike, fought the flood together, searching for solutions to each problem as they came up. McFarland says the decision-making process under that kind of pressure was the equivalent of finding a needle in a haystack over and over again. One of those moments occurred when two city employees were trying to shut off fresh water to flooded homes on the south side of Hamburg. There's so much knowledge in all these city guys and prior city guys. And, and in that situation where Wyatt and Trey was out in this waist deep water with a magnet trying to find, the, find this valve box, you know, we had an old city guy that came out of his house and said, you know, it, it's over here, it's more over that way. And, and they were able to find it and shut off the water. In total, the floods of 2019 had a wide footprint across the Midwest and caused over $12 billion in damages between March 14th and March 31st. For Hamburg, the town spent a million dollars on the first day of the flood, money the town didn't have. Now we were broke. We had, we, we had, we had to, we needed money. And um, that's what we started doing very day of the flood. After we gathered our stuff up in City Hall and moved to the um, elementary school, I started, I started raising money, private funds, because I knew we were going to need probably $20 million to rebuild because of 18 foot of water. So far, we've done um, $18.6 million, and uh, I've got another 20 to 25 that I'm asking for. The recovery process was slow going for Hamburg and surrounding communities. Floodwaters refused to leave farm fields. Two more flood events occurred through the spring and summer of that year. Some farmers reported having standing water in their fields as late as September. The 2019 crop for many in the area was non-existent. But I have to tell you, we first had to get over our tears because for us, it's still emotional. For us, we lost so much. And, um, you know, people were losing their homes and their businesses, but we were losing our town. And um, we had to get over that and suck it up the best we could during the day. We could cry early in the morning, we could cry at night, but suck it up and use it and do everything we can to help rebuild the town. 2019 floodwaters took a lot from Hamburg. 73 homes were ruined. Only six of the city's 44 businesses were able to open the day of the flood. Located next to Interstate 29, as well as being situated along a major railroad line, Hamburg has become an attractive town for agricultural businesses like Manildra Milling Corporation, Bartlett Grain Company, and AgriVision Equipment Group. It's tough to recover from, from something like this, not only as a business. Tim Maher is manager for AgriVision Equipment Group in Hamburg and says when the floodwaters destroyed most of the downtown businesses and inundated nearby farm fields, many of the area farmers found themselves in a different role. Some of them were able to take some of their equipment and actually help with some of the rebuild out on the levee. So they were able to, to go back out and put some of their equipment to work and, and get a little bit of income off of that. We had to change our business because we went from supporting farmers to supporting more of a construction-based business at that time. And a lot of our same customers, but, but they, they switched from being more farming ec economics to, to more of a construction-based business. And it, it really changed the way that we did business on a day-to-day. Mayer's building was uninhabitable for six months after the flood, and he kept the operation running by renting buildings where he could find them. As recovery efforts began, many businesses found ways to cope with the cleanup. We had about eight inches of water throughout the store. We sloped back, so it was deeper in the front, but 
we had to take all of our inventory to our store in Tabor, Iowa, which is about 20 miles north of here and very safe from any flooding related to the Missouri River. And we operated out of there for a little over two months. We were able to run daily deliveries down to Hamburg for people who were still located here and then mail out to anybody who was displaced. Stoner Drug is a local pharmacy and retailer that has called Main Street home for over 125 years. Megan Benefiel, one of the newest pharmacists with the business, chose to return to Hamburg after graduation and work in her hometown because of its people. The thing about being from a small town like Hamburg is we might be small in numbers. There's not a lot of us, but the people who are here truly care about this place and truly care about what it means to be from here. The flood was hard. More people could have just chosen to leave and never come back. You can make a home anywhere with your family. That's not hard. But when the going got tough, we banded together. We took care of each other. We didn't just let it wipe us out like some people maybe think it should have. When the floodwaters finally receded, the people of Hamburg began to rebuild. With help from numerous state, local, and federal agencies, the town began to take on its former shape. But navigating the recovery process brought its own set of challenges. Economic development, homeland security, the governor's office, without them, we would not be where we are now because we're just so little with, with no staff. And to have staff that knows what to do in a disaster, we've got that. But to have staff that knows what to do after it, Hey, I didn't even know what to do after it. I mean, you have to figure it out. That's what you have to do, because every disaster is different. The first step for rebuilding from the 2019 flood events was to stop the water from doing any more damage to the levees. The Army Corps of Engineers began work along the banks of the Missouri River with help from area residents. When you are a local landowner on any of the boards, you know, you have a little bit of skin in the game, which means it's not just uh, I'm just an elected official that represents not only myself, but I, I represent all my neighbors here, too. And with that... Um, John Eskew is a farmer in Thurman, Iowa. He is also a trustee on the boards of the Pleasant Valley Levy District and a trustee for the Missouri Valley Drainage District. Both districts cover 34,000 acres from Thurman to Hamburg. When, when we, we had the catastrophic, catastrophic event, we, we see the, the levees fall. I mean, our, our job before that was mostly just watching, maintaining, communicating with our local officials and communicating with the uh, Army Corps of Engineers of how things are holding up. After that, it is, it is just a, it's like getting a fire hose in the face. It's just, boom, what do we do now? A strong working relationship between the local levy sponsors, trustees, and the Army Corps of Engineers was key to getting work started on levy repair. So without the levy boards, the local levy districts, maintaining these to the core standards, the federal dollars can't come in and fix this. The sponsors have to give us all the materials to fix the levy. We provide the labor. They just have to say, OK, Here's the borrow source, go here, get it. And it's on them to work that deal out. The minute from there, I grab it, bring it down here and do what I need to do. The Army Corps of Engineers needed thousands of yards of material to rebuild the levees. During the flood, the Missouri River deposited tons of sand on farm fields in the area. As a levee sponsor, Askew found a way to help the Army Corps of Engineers and his neighbors at the same time. Through John's help, getting easements, we got into farm fields, scraped the sand off, built our core, and then we had to go find clay to cap it with. That was also John found us the clay. And so then we capped it with clay, put our rock on, and we're good. So it actually ends up being a win-win for the farmers. One, they got their fields cleaned up of all the sand. And two, I put in the levee, so it helped me. As of June of 2020, 2.5 million cubic yards of dirt had been worked into the levee rebuilt just west of Thurman, Iowa, along the Missouri River. The location of the new embankment 
which had been closer to the river, was now two miles further away from the water. The move also restored wildlife habitat that had been lost to river development projects in prior years. The habitat loss was huge. Now, with the, with the help of the NRCS, those kind of agencies, and uh, Iowa DNR, and then the federal CRP program is re reestablishing a lot of this native habitat. Some local residents argue the larger area of wildlife habitat slows floodwaters from receding and holds it longer in the soil, making the area prone to more flooding. Their belief is the levee should be as close to the river as possible, so the water stays in the channel and moves away from the nearby towns and farm fields. So those floods have become more intense because if the channel can't carry the water, you know, it goes between the levee and the river, and then when you carry that much water out there, it drops a lot of silt. So there's, those areas are starting to silt in, so you don't have the carrying capacity. So you actually create bigger floods down the road. And so that's, that's one of the reasons. Um, and maybe, you know, we've had bigger events or we've always had big events, but it seems like they're magnified because of the lack of carrying capacity. So, and you know. Dave Seek is a farmer and representative for Iowa House District 23, which covers Mills, Fremont, and portions of Montgomery counties. Seek sees a major hurdle in flood recovery with how the numerous independent levee districts along the river have to navigate emergency flood response with various federal agencies. You know, we have a, a several levee and drainage districts from Council Bluffs South, but now the federal government is counting that all as one levee. So with it being one levee, we have, every one of these has a, a board, Every one of these has a taxing authority, and every one of these has, you know, their, their own way of doing things. And what happens is when, when we do have a flood emergency, or what we've had happen here, FEMA has to come in and deal with one of, every one of those entities separately. We need to consolidate them because if they do do a levy certification study, or if they do need money, every entity has to go look for it. Like I said, the, the state government has to deal with it, the federal government has to deal with it. It's a lot of duplications. We're a very fortunate state. We have had navigable water on both sides of our state for over 100, I think 60 years. And we have that luxury and we should always try to, try to take care of that because that's, that's a method for us staying prosperous and you know, being able to develop as a state. Seek also sits on the Iowa Flood Mitigation Board, which provided funding to recovery efforts in his district after the 2019 disaster. I think the Flood Mitigation Board is an important thing for Iowa to have and maintain. And I think that the extra layer that they've added because of the flood of 2019, whereas they can, uh, the state can appropriate money to fix things that's not, or, or do cost shares that's not covered by the federal government, it's very important. Because of the 2019 disasters, the Iowa Flood Mitigation Board was assigned expanded authority to approve money for long-term recovery projects. The board approved $400,000 for a study on the efficiency of levee districts along the Missouri River in Southwest Iowa. Not many states have a handle on what we're talking about here with having so many varied types of levees and drainage systems under different people's control. And somebody needs to get a handle on it as Iowa if we're gonna prosper in the future so that we make sure that they're maintained and controlled because it'll make it better for all of us. The governmental agencies helping towns recover from flood events are employing new tools to speed up response times. The National Rural Water Association is developing a program to help with the effort. Whenever there's a disaster declaration done, they upload a program in, into our log system that uh, they want us to fill out when we arrive on scene. And then the big thing is assessment on money. What does that town need to get that water system or that wastewater system back going? And we upload this on the spot. We GPS everything. We take live photos, and this automatically gets sent to National Rural Water, then in turn gets sent to USDA and a lot of government officials. So they can know within minutes of us arriving on scene of 
what's going on in that town and what are the major concerns pertaining to the water and drinking water side of things. Iowa Secretary of Agriculture Mike Neg has had a front row seat to weather disasters across the state. He points out, helping farmers and families recover is one of the major roles taken on by the state. But the assistance is only part of the recovery equation. It is true that at some point you would say that, well, the federal government shouldn't keep coming in and, and having to pay for this recovery and, and restoration of land. And there are limitations. You can only use certain programs every so often and you can max out and I think that's I think that's appropriate but again do they have the tools that they need and that all farmers need to be able to withstand weather events uh, those are the things we should be thinking about at the end of the day there are many who ask why do people live in a place that continually floods the answers vary this is a challenging topic because, you know, I've, I've spent a lot of time in, in areas that have had flood damage. And, you know, one of the things that sticks with me is that these aren't, uh, these aren't families that just moved onto this land a few years ago. You're talking about generations of farm families that, that have farmed this land. It's something different when it takes away your home because that's, that's your whole world. That's the bubble that you live in as your home, your property. And yeah, it's, it's terrible to lose and it's hard to lose. What I'm really appreciative of is that my family came here way over 100 years ago. They were to deal with floods. They were able to deal with uh, and grow crops here and build a family and build a um, and I can do the same thing here too. I've lived there my whole life. I've dealt with floods. I mean, I wasn't there for the 52 flood. My grandfather told me all about it and how high the water got. But, you know, I was there just for every flood after that, basically, from when I was a kid. And so I've lived through a lot of them. Every one of them's different. Everybody will tell you that. But, um, I advocated, you know, I've been I've been drug along the whole time and advocated for, you know, managing the river in a responsible way that we don't lose our land. I was born and raised here. I spent, you know, 18 years in the school system. I left for a little bit. I went to Lincoln for undergrad and then Omaha for pharmacy school and kind of divine intervention brought me back, but now I can't picture myself anywhere else. It's devastating, but why do you stay? You stay because this is your home. And you gotta stop and think what that word means to you. To me, uh, that word means uh, my relative who was one of the people that founded this town. And all of those relatives that that I have known of that lived in this town. And certainly all of my grandparents and my mother and father and my brothers, I mean, my brothers both are still in this town. Um, it is, home is family. And uh, we ain't moving. As of 2022, Hamburg continues with its comeback. All 44 businesses in town have reopened and all of their employees have returned to work. Nine new businesses, including a hotel, coffee shop, and a meat locker have been added to the roster of businesses. Crane credits all the hard work by the people of Hamburg for rebuilding the town's economy. But she believes it's the town spirit that is the true currency in Hamburg. They see progress and they're, they're glad it's happened. We're still in pain from this flood happening because we are emotionally connected to the people in a very long way, you know, a very um, old fashioned way where you really know them. You don't just kind of know them. You, I know your dog's name. I know your horse's name. I know your favorite car. You know, this, we know people here.
Dubuque, Iowa rests between the Mississippi River and large bluff formations in the driftless region of Northeast Iowa. Founded in 1875, Iowa's oldest city has endured numerous struggles with flooding, managing respect for the river while promoting community growth and civic expansion have not always gone hand in hand. So I think that the unique thing about Dubuque is maybe from other Iowa communities is, is we're on the, on the river, we have bluffs, steep terrain, and we have flash flooding. From the start as a small river town, Dubuque has always had strong communities. Irish and German heritage runs deep along the steep streets. As the city flourished, the Bee Branch Creek on the north side of town of 60,000 was buried to allow for expansion of housing and industry. The man-made changes to the landscape promoted flash flooding in some parts of town. In the Bee Branch watershed, multiple years of flooding events began to take a toll on those living creekside. When you'd hear the predictions of these heavy rains coming, um, you would worry. And um, the anxiety that not just myself, but my neighbors felt not knowing what we were going to wake up to the next morning. How bad was it going to be? You know, how devastating, because we lived through some very devastating floods. Maury is a lifelong resident of Dubuque. She has witnessed countless floods in the 40 years she has called the North End neighborhood her home. I remember looking down somewhere around midnight or middle of the night and opening the door and looking down my stairway to the basement. And all I could see was water. It was a sea of water. And the um, feeling of helplessness that you had no control, you couldn't prevent it. And while that story is, is devastating. It was not unique because so many of my neighbors lived with almost the same type of story that I lived with. The decades old solution continued to be a problem in the six square mile section inside the city limits. Unfortunately, Dubuque's answer to the frequent flooding of backyards and basements only offered a limited solution to the problem. It was only a six inch rainfall, but the difference was the city had no real flood mitigation programs in place, no retention basins, none of those sorts of things. It was a six inch rainfall, and of course the city has developed more and more on the hillside, so guess what? You replace uh, hillsides and all the natural vegetation with rooftops and driveways, water runs downhill. Millions of dollars in damage was becoming a major issue for North End residents. For them, it was more than just seeing flood ravaged houses and businesses every day. It was about facing the difficult decision of whether to stay or move away. I love where I live and I love my neighbors. I don't want to leave. And the best you can hope for is that you will get some hope and relief sometime. After years of waiting, the residents along the Bee Branch received word the city was going to make changes that wouldn't just mitigate the problem, but bring it to a full stop. If you live in these areas, you know, you get four foot of water in your basement one year. So, okay, I got to miss work. I, I got to pump my basement out. I don't know how I'm going to do that. Now I've got all these moldy stuff down there. I've got to get rid of it. Maybe my water heater and my electrical boxes were impacted and I got to pay for those to get replaced. And then you work through that, you know, and it can be costly, you know. And then two years later, it happens again. And then two years later, it happens again. It's just not sustainable for, I don't, I don't care who you are, you're, you're not going to want to live through that multiple times. And six times that happened, in 12 years. And so that really leads, you know, if we left and did nothing, you've got an area of your community that's just gonna go by the wayside. It's just gonna slowly but surely 
you know, fall into disrepair and, and, and just not something you want in your community. So, um, Darren Muring really is a civil impressive. engineer with the city of Dubuque and is in charge of the B Branch restoration project. Muring notes, between 1999 and 2011, presidential disaster declarations were issued six times due to the amount of destruction from flood events in the B Branch watershed. These people who live in these areas, you know, 1,300 properties or so, 1,300 families, they can't do anything by themselves. And they might have spent their last, you know, scraped together as much money they could to buy their first home, you know, buy their piece of the American dream, and then to have it flood every other year and turn into a nightmare, and then they're trapped because they don't have the resources to either keep fixing their house or having the resources to move to a different house. So we, we really had to step in in a community to, to look at the issue. The city's first step was to get insight from the people whose homes were flooded. In 2003, a citizen advisory committee was formed to bring ideas and concerns to the engineers in charge of designing a flood mitigation project for Dubuque. Audrey Mori was one of its members. And over the years that we met about how this was all going to end up, we heard a lot of encouragement from the city that this was not just going to be a waterway dug run through our neighborhood, which was a little worrisome for us for a while about the safety of water going through your neighborhood with children. And then what was it going to look like? There was a lot of fear at the beginning because understanding what this could be, you know, especially, you know, we bring up the idea of a of daylighting a creek or or having an above ground sewer, people are, well, you're just gonna have a sewer going through our neighborhoods. And so working through that process and, and and so we got to a collective vision of what this could be involving the citizens with that was, was very important. A solution for Dubuque's chronic flash flooding had to solve problems on many fronts. Basements needed to be dry. Streets needed to be in good repair. Flood mitigation needed to last for decades. And the project had to be aesthetically pleasing. The committee proposed a plan to daylight or unearth the Bee Branch Creek into an open waterway. In 2004, Dubuque City Council approved the Bee Branch Restoration Project. Before the heavy equipment could roll, the city needed to purchase properties along the creek to make room for what was to become the Bee Branch Basin. This was the city's opportunity to earn the trust of a skeptical neighborhood. But I will say when we put in the B Branch Greenway, the city did right by the people who lived along that Greenway. The, the project included buying out about 70 homes and a number of small businesses. And after that happened, I talked to some of the residents whose homes the city bought and said, did, did, did you do well? Did you do okay when you sold your home? And they responded, Are absolutely. The city of Dubuque actually probably paid me more for my home and helped me move to another location, more so than if I had tried to just put my home on the market and sell it on my own. With properties purchased and cleared, construction got underway in 2005. Local residents saw changes almost immediately. One of the biggest things that we noticed kind of right off the bat when they first started actually opening the trench up, it kind of helped to drop the water table in this area. So there's more space, even within the ground that's here, to absorb more water um, than what we had before. The Bee Branch Greenway works like a basin for floodwaters to collect in heavy rain events. By having the open waterway, Rainwater levels can rise and fall in the greenway without flooding the nearby streets and neighborhoods. When the waters recede, the area returns to being a linear green space. Well, I mean, as engineers, we try to think of everything, knowing we can't, but we still try. And so, you know, for example, watching it actually function the way we, you know, had you know, drawn it up and how the calculations showed it that it would function. Uh, it's very satisfying and it's also very comforting. Um, you know, it's that 
that it's, it's addressing the issue that it was supposed to, that it's doing it in a way that's you know, environmentally friendly and, and safe to the, to the neighbors that are around the areas. I walk up to the bee branch and I'll look out over it and it's working exactly as it was supposed to work. It was built for a 500 year flood and the whole bee branch uh, greenway you will see the water just rising like it's supposed to and filling up between the banks. And it keeps all, and every time I look, I say, if this water wasn't here, it would be in our basements right now and we'd all be bailing water again. Restoring the Bee Branch watershed, along with constructing accompanying amenities, would span 14 years. The nearly $250 million price tag for the project came from a multitude of sources. The city partnered with federal, state, and local agencies to help diversify costs. A large source of funding came from the Iowa Flood Mitigation Board, which was created by the Iowa legislature in 2012 and signed into law by Governor Branstad. The board approved funding the Bee Branch Restoration Project through sales tax increments. Senator Rob Hogue of Cedar Rapids believes the legislation he led through the Iowa legislature a decade ago is a lifeline for many Iowa communities facing situations like Dubuque. So I remember when Senator Yoakum came to me with Dubuque's unique circumstances. And we just said, we will adjust the legislation and make it work for Dubuque. Mm -hmm. um, we made it work for people who cared about the environment. So we made sure that legislation addressed uh, downstream effects and watershed management. We made sure it worked for the business community to say that we wanted to invest in places where there were going to be um, uh, economic projects associated with it. A particular must do from the Citizen Advisory Committee was on the appearance and functionality of the Bee Branch Basin. To me, there's two aspects of this project. There's the flood mitigation aspect of it. And then there's the beautiful piece of property, you know, park aspect of it. And this is what we get to see every day, is this beautiful park and everything like that. But it's hiding a flooded mitigation, you know, dam or wall. You know, typically those things are not, they, they're not pretty. And they're not easy to jazz, to, to make nice. And this is a really nice amenity. I mean, it's a nice day out here today. People are using it. People are consuming it. People are being a part of it. You know, it's, and that's, and that's the beauty of it is it's, is it's a usable, you know, amenity. It's not just something that's just there. You know, it's not just a, a sewer, it's not just a storm drain, it's not just, you know, it's not just something basic. Opening up the Bee Branch Creek and restoring the watershed laid the groundwork for development of a park with multi-use trails, an outdoor amphitheater, and a playground. It also made it possible to start environmental projects like pollinator gardens, the planting of trees, and the seeding of native prairie grasses. You know, this is a $240 million project, and there's no, there's no one who, from the city, would have thought that we, we would have been able to put together the partnerships that we did with, with local, state, and federal partners to really make it what it is today. I mean, we, we, we couldn't have done it without, without their assistance, not only their technical assistance, but their financial assistance, just teaming with them um, to make this a reality. Uh, so one of the things that I always look back on is a community can't, you can't look at it like, well, that project's, that problem's too big. We, we just, we, there's no way we'll be able to afford that. There's no way. But as you work through the process and work with project partners and work with the citizens, it, it's incredible what a community even our size can accomplish. Beyond the peace of mind generated by the project, after nearly two decades, People living in the neighborhoods along the Bee Branch feel a renewed sense of pride in their community. One of the conversations that I had with a neighbor, and this was a while after the completion of the Bee Branch mitigation project, and we were standing in our backyards talking, and they were predicting heavy rains, high winds, for that night. And he said to me, do you remember when we would be worried when we heard that prediction? And now we don't worry anymore.
The distance between the end of a flood and complete recovery is often measured in years. The equation for how to approach the next Iowa flood is already being worked out. So we talk infrastructure a lot with uh, the dams built back last century are not built for this century, given the increase in the amount of rainfall that we're seeing. You look at the upper Midwest, anywhere over the last 126 years, 10 to 15 percent increase plus in the amount of rainfall. For Glisten, there is no if in this equation, but a when. We're planning if things, if X, Y, and Z happen, what, what can be done. What keeps me up at night are the possibilities of what the wet conditions will mean as we get into the middle of the century. I think the expectation is, is we're going to have more aerial flooding, we're going to have more flash flooding events. Government officials at all levels are the ones who put in place the plans for the response to natural disasters. An integral point in planning centers on mankind's role as both being part of the problem and part of the solution in future flood events. We've had uh, 20 presidential disaster declarations in Iowa in the last 15 years. So that's more than one a year because of flooding. I'm not talking about other disasters, just talking about flooding. The reality is, is that large precipitation events in Iowa have increased about 40% over the last four or five decades. And the scientists tell us that is because of climate change. We have an obligation as a government, whether it's state or local or federal, to make sure that we do right by the people. And if this, if this whole flood mitigation program and some of the, the things that we're attempting to do at least demonstrates that government really can do good work and has an important role to play in, in people's lives in terms of safety and, and economics and all the rest of it. Flooding takes a toll on more than just the landscape, the bricks and mortar of local buildings, and the houses left in its wake. It's the effect on the people that stay in those Iowa communities long after cleanup is complete. Go visit with somebody who stepped out their back door one day after a storm event or a flood event and saw everything that they had built, perhaps over their, their lifetime or certainly their career, wiped away or laying in a pile. And uh, they oftentimes don't know where to start. Um, but, uh, but again, it, you know, it's, it's something where I feel a responsibility and an opportunity as the Secretary of Ag, but also as, as government being a partner and helping, helping to folks to make that first step or, or how can they, they start to rebuild. These experiences change you. You're different, you're a little bit harder. We try to keep our kindness, but we're harder now than we used to be. Funding for this program was provided by Friends, the Iowa PBS Foundation, as well as generations of families and friends who feel passionate about the programs they watch on Iowa PBS. Funding for this program was provided by the Gilchrist Foundation, founded by Jocelyn Gilchrist, furthering the philanthropic interests of the Gilchrist family in wildlife and conservation, the arts and public broadcasting, and disaster relief and by the Claude P. Small, Catherine Small Cousins, and William Carl Cousins Fund at the Quad Cities Community Foundation to support nature programming on Iowa PBS.